Good evening. What I want to talk about tonight is a psalm that we do before the blowing of the shofar. It's pretty much a universal custom that Psalm 47, that's Lam Natseach Livnei Korach Mizmor, um, is read uh, as an introduction to the service of the blowing of the shofar. And um, my question is, you know, why? Um, what does uh, that psalm have in particular? That's probably the easier answer, a question to answer. Um, but um, why do the sons of Korach, um, not known uh, for their uh, up upstanding character and standing in the community, um, why are they kind of being given the microphone at what is arguably one of the holiest moments of the year, just before we are about to uh, communicate with Hashem uh, by way of, of the shofar. Um, and there we give these uh, B'nai Korach uh, quite a bit of, of, of prominence. How, how do we explain that? Um, so, you know, where is this? Yeah. Um, why... Um, why quote the sons of Korach at that particular time? Um, yes, um, it's a very appropriate song. If you look at it carefully, you know, they, 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 it talks about the, 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 the great power of God. And it, it talks about uh, you know, sounding the shofar to Hashem, Hashem ascending uh, with a blast, with a sound of shofar, make music for God, music. You know, it's very appropriate. And Rosh Hashanah is about crowning King, sorry, crowning Hashem. As king of the world, and yes, um, this is a very powerful psalm that describes all all of this. Um, but the question still remains: you know, why this psalm, uh, authored by the sons of Korach, if it's because there are citations, there are quotes from this verse uh, that are very appropriate at that time? Let's let's take them out the psalm. Uh, for example, before shofar blowing, we read those those seven verses. They're, they're a collection. They come from all different places, as you can see, because I actually left the, uh, uh, this is, thank you, I, I photographed this from an art scroll, but you can see the, the footnotes, one, two, three, four, five, and six, seven, um, they come from, they come from uh, Tehillim mainly, um, yeah, two, two, uh, two um, um, uh, chapters in Tehillim, 118, and then 119, and there is number two, uh, that's from uh, Lamentations Eicha. Um, so they are at least um, out of the seven five that are from Psalm 119. I'm pleased that nobody decided um, that they should be accustomed to recite Psalm 119 um, before Shofar blowing uh, seven times, because that uh, um, would take quite a, a while. Uh, yeah. As you know, Psalm 119 is, is, is the longest in the whole book of Tehillim. Um, it has uh, you know eight verses for each letter of the, of the alphabet, do you math? Um, and that would take quite a while. And so we are not uh, reading that psalm, but we could likewise take out of context uh, those uh, few pasukim, those few verses that are relevant. We don't do that. And by the way, while we're here, just to point out to you that these verses, if you look at the bold, um, Kuf, Resh, Ein, Sin, Tet, Nun, spell out, cross Satan or destroy Satan, uh, rip up uh, the power of Satan. And, and that's one of the reasons uh, why we recite um, these verses um, at that point. So, you know, we got to get to the bottom of what the power of this uh, particular psalm is. Um, and here's one reason. In fact, if you look in your article, Machza, it'll be in the footnotes at the bottom. And um, that this Psalm contains the word Elohim seven times over. Elohim is the name of Hashem um, that represents um, God's attribute of judgment, um, and, and we want to um, we want to uh, you know appeal to God's sense of judgment and, and sweeten it uh, when we talk about God's attribute of, of kindness and forgiveness. We use another name, Hashem. Uh, as they give it over here in in in, in most translations, um, and Elohim that's normally translated as God, uh, whereas Hashem as as Lord. So why um, um, seven times we recite the psalm seven times, and that gives you the number forty nine, um, and forty nine is an important number. 
uh, 49, uh, we are familiar with from um, the counting of the Omer. Um, when we go through 49 degrees of self-perfection to try and reach the highest level. So we're told that there are 49 kind of descents that a person can go to, 49 gates of impurity, as they refer to. And, and, and beyond that, you don't want to go, because once you get to number 50, then you know there, there, there isn't the ladder that reaches low enough to, to, to pull you out of there. So you, you're kind of in stock. Uh, but if you've only sunk to number 49, you're still redeemable. And they always talk about the Jews in Mitzrayim being uh, at the 49th gate of impurity. And Hashem pulls them out of there at the very last moment. And that's why the exodus from Egypt is described as a flight. Because essentially God kind of pulled us out from Egypt. We had nothing to do. We didn't have enough resources of our own to be able to get ourselves out of Egypt on the spiritual level because of that. And that's why it'll take 49 days of kind of going one step at a time until we finally ready at Mount Sinai to receive the Torah. Um, and then when we reenact that every year, uh, counting 49 days of the of the over, it's it's more about self refinement and going up. And uh, at the other end of the scale, um, there's also 49 gates of refinement, um, and humans don't really reach the 50th gate. Moshe Rabbeinu, on his final day, we read about in the Pasha this past Shabbos, reaches the 50th gate. Um, but at that point, um, you know, his, his mission on, on earth is, is complete. So there's a reference to those 49 gates by using the power of the, the divine strength uh, and power um, seven times, seven, reading the song over seven times to, to appeal to that. Um, but that doesn't answer the question as to, you know, why the sons of Korach there? Um, and really what we need to address is why are the sons of Korach um, I wouldn't say prolific, but definitely strong contributing uh, uh, authors of the book of Tehillim. Like, what, what are they doing? They were involved in their, their father's rebellion. In fact, they were pretty active in their father's rebellion, which was which was hectic. It was kind of turning the people over, challenging the power, uh, the leadership of Moshe, um, questioning whether God had really. Um, appointed Moshe to the position that he was in, uh, accusing uh, the, um, the the appointment of Aaron as being one of nepotism. Uh, it, it, it was a very serious rebellion um, and re insurrection, uh, and, and they were fully part of it. Um, why do they, when do they become authors of Tehillim? So we find out about the sons of Korach uh, because where it's described, it's in a portion called Korach. Um, and there it describes uh, the earth opening up and swallowing up Korach and his family. Um, and it's only in what is 40 years later in, in, in chronology, a few parishes down in the portion of Pinchas, that we discover that no, um, somehow they did not um, share their father's fate. Um, and this is what the verse says. Uh, yes, the earth um, opened its mouth, swallowed them up. So it's you know a recollection of what had happened uh, forty years earlier, uh, and and they died when the fire consumed two hundred fifty men, and they became an example. The sons of Korach, however, did not die. So so what happened to them? So um, Rashi quotes from the Gemara. The Gemara tells us a story. Uh, yeah, Rashi. Um, the Gemara in Sanhedrin uh, actually is a very fascinating um, uh, description um, of um, a Canaanite merchant that uh, gave the rabbi a tour of the desert. He says, "Come, I'm going to show you where the opening of the you know Gehenna is. That's where um, the, this, the earth opened its its mouth, um, and." Uh, and uh, he arrives there, and, and there's a voice coming out. And the voice says, Moshe Emet, Torah, Torah Emet, Moses is true. So Korach is there, and he's kind of trying to uh, to say, I was wrong, I was wrong. Uh, but the Gemara says that the sons of Korach, who didn't die, they were in the plot originally. But when the rebellion broke out, they had thoughts of repentance in their hearts. And a high spot was fenced round for them in Gehinnom, and they stayed there. Um, so somehow they didn't kind of go into the abyss all the way, 
a ledge appeared or somewhere that they could hold on to for dear life, and they kind of didn't sink into Gehenna. Um, and, and, and there they were stuck, um, not part of the living, but not part of the uh, the dead either. In fact, if you, if you look, you know, the, the Torah doesn't say the sons of Korach lived, but rather the sons of Korach did not die. Uh, not being dead doesn't mean being alive, as in the situation of, of the, the sons of Korach, uh, who were literally in limbo. Uh, I think the origin of that word is in some kind of a, a mythology where there's a place that souls who uh, cannot get to the other side remain in that place called limbo. And so we use that, uh, but you know, for to, to, to explain situations where we kind of not here nor there. Uh, so literally, sons of Korach are in, in Gehenom, but there's a, a legend, they're holding on to that legend, and, and, and they're there. Um, and at some point, um, they come out. And um, where do we get a bit more information? Rashi um, on Tehillim. Uh, I think it's Psalm 42, which is the first, um, which is the first of the um, Psalms by the sons of Korach. Um, in, and, and, and they, I'm not mistaken, they're, they're several, I think they're 10 uh, or so. Um, and, and, and Rashi there says, we're talking about the three sons. I say, okay, maybe yourself. At first, they were in their father's council. Uh, the trial of the controversy, they pardoned them. When all those around them were swallowed up, and the earth opened its mouth, the place was left within the mouth of the earth as the matter that is stated in Numbers, we just read. Sons of Korach did not die. There they uttered a song, and there they composed these songs. Then, at some point, it doesn't say where, they ascended from there, the Holy Spirit rested on them, and they prophesied concerning the exiles destruction of a temple and Davidic dynasty, so those are the, the various psalms that are, you know, all Livnei Korach. Uh, Livnei Korach, Livnei Korach, Mizmor, there are a few um, of those. So Rashi um, gets a bit more specific and is actually, you know, quoting from other sources, like very little of what's in Rashi, virtually nothing of what's in Rashi is is, is original, he's forever quoting Midrashim, Talmud, etc., um, and, and and there he's saying, when did their teshuva happen? All right, when those were swallowed up, uh, the earth opened their mouth. Um, that's kind of when they parted uh, the controversy. Um, that's when the teshuva happened, um, and that's a very crucial point to bear um, in mind um, when we talk talking about why. Uh, the song is 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 is, is read here. I mean, um, it, it it it's it's also, and perhaps let's start with that um, to put it into context. Um, Shofa, um happens right after the story of Hannah, uh, which is the after of the day, um, and Hannah, of course, had a husband called Elkanah. Um, I wouldn't say no relation to this Elkanah. Yes, of course, there's a relation. Um, and um, she was the mother of Shmuel, Samuel. Um, and if you look in, this is in the very end Chronicles, chapter 6. It gives us the, uh, and it's, Chronicles is a word, it's very interesting. So it's, it's, it's hard to sort of follow. Uh, so I've made the, the road uh, uh, easier for you. Uh, uh, but here we have the generations. Going from um, Kohat, I mean Adav. So Kohat, of course, is the son of Levi. Kohat, I mean Adav, where the son Korach, Elkanah. This is according to the version in um, the Rei Yamim. Um, and then we have another um, um, gentleman called Achimot. Um, and then um, Elkanah, who seems to be named after his. Um, grandfather, um, and that Elkanah is the um, father of Shmuel Hanavi. Um, so we put the whole thing in context, but that's a powerful message. Um, in that, uh, yes, um, there was there was Teshuvah um, by the sons of Korach, um, and then as a result, we read the story of the birth of the illustrious descendant. Um, on Rosh Hashanah, uh, to, and that shows us, you know, the, the, the contextualizes the um, the Haftarah and links it with the 
with the shofar. Uh, by showing us the power of tshuva, of course, the moment of a blowing shofar is going to be one that is going to be, you know, expressing our deepest uh, tshuva, um, our deepest regret. Um, it's going to express things uh, that we cannot verbalize, and that's what the sound of the shofar is. It's about, um, you know, a cry from the heart uh, that cannot be said uh, in words. Um, so, first of all, it's telling us about, um, you know, the, the results of that shiva. But it's also telling us a very important message. And that is that the shiva is one, and this may be contradicting somewhat what I said uh, uh, last week, but you know, that was the ultimate shiva, which is, uh, you know, not out of fear and not out of, uh, you know, uh, Hashem calling you out in the Garden of Eden and saying, what have you done? Uh, but spontaneous. Uh, and the sons of Korach's shiva was anything but spontaneous. Uh, it was the very, very last minute uh, to Shuvah. It was when the earth was really swallowing them up and they were about to return their soul to their maker um, and, and fall into the abyss. And it's at that point that it turned around. Uh, and what does it say? If we look back at that Rashi, uh, I'm not going to put it back on the screen now. Uh, it says they, they had thoughts of the sugar in, in their heart. Um, thoughts. They couldn't even verbalize it. I mean, here is this huge earthquake and the earth is swallowing up people alive and there's fire all around them um, and there isn't really, you know, the the, the time or the place, uh, the circumstances to suddenly, you know, start uh, saying al uh, and, 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 and a final vidui. Uh, there's no time to verbalize anything. Um, so it's just a, a thought of Teshuva. A thought of Teshuva has unbelievable power. Um, I'm going to illustrate this with a, a, a fascinating point in Jewish law, brought down the Talmud in uh, Kiddushin. Talmud says the following. person has made a conditional marriage. What happens if you if you make a conditional marriage and you say, you know, you are a Hibah betrothed to me um, on condition that I am a millionaire. And then you get a bank statement and uh, the figure doesn't uh, even reach a hundred thousand, never mind a million uh, in rands even. Um, so that marriage is null and void. If you make conditions on a marriage, uh, if you make a condition on a marriage that you will be married to this, betrothed to this woman on condition that uh, you give her, you know, a, a house in the Mschlange, um, and 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 you don't, and condition isn't fulfilled. This man made a condition of a marriage on condition I'm a righteous man. Turns out that he is anything but a righteous man. He's actually a, a wicked person. His actions, um, the moments before he uttered the Harat Kudeshitli with the words Aminat Shanid Sadiq Gamur. Um, he was not behaving uh, leading up to the chuppah the way Tzadik does. And his behavior subsequent to uh, the betrothal ceremony belies the fact that he's you know, done any kind of teshuva because um, he's continuing in his old ways. But the marriage is deemed valid because maybe in the meantime, at the time that he said those words, he had thoughts of repentance in his mind. Thoughts of repentance, but he wrote Shuvah Belibo. So he's thinking of Teshuvah, and that in itself um, is enough to, to take him into that potential status of Tzadik Gamur, the complete Tzadik, because he's thinking uh, Teshuvah. Teshuvah doesn't have to be um, a, a yeah, of course, it has to be sustained, uh, but at the moment of Teshuvah, even if it's a thought, even if it's fleeting thought, and that in itself can can turn the entire uh, situation um, around, and that's what the shofar is. It's that call. Um, and what do we do before blowing the blowing shofar? We read about the bnei Korach. We remember that story of the sons of Korach thinking, "God, God, God, we were wrong. Moshe was right," as they were stepping into the ground, and there was sufficient enough. For them, according to some opinions, they stayed on that ledge for um, 
for the next 38 years until the end. Uh, and then they had to, uh, so I wonder who had the job of going to uh, bring them food every single day. Um, maybe manna fell into a crack as well. I'm not sure. Uh, but it must have been a pretty miserable existence. Um, but there is a view that they remained there for the entire uh, period of uh, the sojourn in the desert. But theirs was a thought, a call, a desperate voice that could not even be expressed. And that's exactly what we're about to do. Once we finish that psalm and the other seven uh, verses and we read the brochas, we're going to blow shofar. What is that shofar? That shofar is, is a call from the depths of the core. It's not expressed in words. Before we use words in our chakras, we will try and verbalize our feelings and our thoughts in Musaf. Um, but there is this overwhelming um, moment at which there are things that we cannot say and the things that are in the heart. And we preface those by referring back to that, that story of, of the sons of Korah. Talmud in Abu Dazawa tells us a story of a fairly wicked man. It turns out that he had visited every woman of uh, ill repute in the, the Middle East. Um, and uh, yeah, eventually he found out that there was a particular time where there was, you know, still one more um, visit he had to pay. He goes off there and, and somehow this woman triggers him uh, by, by making him realize that, you know, he's he's a perverted, uh, immoral person and, and uh, he realizes he's got to He's got to change his ways. And he's, uh, the Talmud relates that he goes out and he looks up at the mountains. It says, "Mountains, please, um, you know, uh, save me. Uh, heaven and earth, please save me." He's looking for for all kinds of of, of kind of external hooks to hang his teshuva on, or maybe to to blame his life of of sin. Uh, upon and then eventually he realizes you know that's not the point and uh, the Talmud says Elizabeth Dudaya says the matter depends on nothing other than myself and then he placed his head between his knees and he cried loudly and his soul left his body a divine voice emerged and said Elizabeth Dudaya is destined for life in the world to come um, but, but I mean where was he coming from you know he had a life of absolute immorality um, and then he turned himself around and, 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 and cried and his soul left him in kind of purity with the divine voice calling out and saying he's destined for life in the world to come and the Talmud concluded Yudha Nasi heard this heavenly voice and he wept it was emotional he says there are those who can acquire their share in the world to come after many years of Torah but it's also possible to acquire your share in the world to come in one moment. One of those moments is that of uh, blowing of the shofar. One of those moments is, is that um, a voice without words, uh, the non-verbal cry that comes out during the time of shofar. And uh, a good introduction to this, of course, is the story of the sons of, of Korach, of the very, very, very last minute voiceless, wordless, uh, expressionless thought of Teshuvah, telling all of us uh, to maximize the moment of uh, the blood of Shefer that will follow. Thank you very much, and uh, Shana Tava to all.